Welcome to Riffin' on Jazz. I'm Howard Robertson. And I'm Malvin Massey. And Riffin' on Jazz is your weekly visit with friends talking about the music that we love. That classic African-American art form called jazz. Malvin. Howard. Man, Good welcome to, to episode do. Yeah. Dose. <laughs> It's, it's good to be back and, and, and doing this and thinking about jazz again like we would, like we did the last time. It was really cool, man. Yeah, you know, yeah I, I enjoyed we, that. I enjoyed yeah. that. And today, special, special, speaking of jazz, we're going to talk about jazz definitely and definitively. Like, what is jazz, man? I mean, it's so maligned, so misunderstood. So many people have so many different ideas about the definition of jazz and we're going to get into that today uh, yeah yeah get into that today and as a matter of fact we're going to let the masters of jazz talk okay we're going to start with Rollins right let's start with Sonny Rollins all right see what he's got to say about it well jazz is a force of nature it's a feeling it's a sense of liberation sense of communing with nature with higher Things. That's what it is for me. For some people, it's a sense of abandon. That's why uh, you see people, some people listen to jazz, they want to dance. That's an element of it. But you know, people go to church and they also have a sense of abandon. And they dance and everything in church. So I, I, I am saying that because People that want to detract from jazz would say that, oh, it's abandoned, that means you're doing something evil. That's the theme for the day, man. We're gonna mm-hmm. let the masters define jazz, and that was the great Sonny Rollins. Yeah, and he, who could do it better than him who anyway? Who do it better? You know, and, and because of Rollins, being the artist that he is, and his definition of it, it sort of sets a background for everybody else's definition to fall behind that. Right. You know, right. Uh, because I think what he said was cool, but we're gonna find out. We gotta find out what uh, what you guys think. What you think? Okay. You know, okay. We're gonna is, get into that. We're gonna get into the definition and what different people think about it. But um, you've got you've got an example of one of the earliest, uh, well, one of the yeah, pioneers, pioneers of jazz. And and not only that, but one of the pioneers of jazz playing the music of the pioneer of blues, which led to jazz. It's, okay. Uh, Louis Armstrong playing the music of W. C. Handy. Wow. Wow. From yeah. right here in Memphis. Too. Right well, here in Memphis. Too. Actually, he was from Florence, Alabama. But he made a name for himself on Beale Street in Memphis. Well, uh, yeah, well, he came from, well, anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and his, his, his evolution came around the way he was here in Lewis from down in Louisiana. Oh, right. Yeah, I guess that gels Memphis and Louisiana together with jazz. That's exactly right, like the river. So, Louis Armstrong. Folks, I've just been down, down to Memphis town. That's where the people smile, smile on you all the while. Hospitality, they were good to me. I couldn't spend a dime and had the grandest time. I went.
went out to dancing with a Tennessee deer. They had a fella named Handy with a band you should hear. And while the folks gently sway, all the boys begin to play real harmony. I never will forget the tune they call Handy's Memphis Blues. Oh, yes, those blues. They got a trumpet man leading the band. And folks, he sure blows them on. And when the clarinet seconds to the trombone's crew, it moans just like a sinner on revival day. That melancholy strain, that ever haunting refrain. Is like a morning sorrow song. Here comes the very part that wraps a spell around my heart. It sets me wide to hear that loving tune again. Those memories. Strong, yeah, playing uh, the a quintessential <laughs> Memphis cut, Memphis blue. That's right, that's right. That's w- amazing. W- Memphis name been WC Hand. Yeah, Memphis name been in music for since all this time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Still you know, have you heard the uh, have you heard the designation? Memphis is mentioned in more songs than any other place on earth, no and, and heaven. <laughs> <laughs> And no kidding. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's like uh, five hundred or and something songs. Yeah, that's a fact. Memphis is mentioned in more places. Well, that one, Lewis, the the significance of us doing that one. Okay, was that the Armstrong played this on their CD? Uh, Armstrong plays W. C. Handy. Mm-hmm. So it came out as an album back in nineteen fifty four. Handy wrote that song. He, his most famous song Louis, it was St. Louis Blues. Right. They stole the prop. They stole the rights from that one for him. He uh, he got ripped off. Right. So he came back and he wrote the Memphis Blues, but he got hired by Boss Crump to write him a campaign song, and that was the campaign song. It was three composers, three bands and in y'all Memphis. I don't know who Boss Crump is. Boss but, Crump was the mayor yeah. of Memphis. <laughs> For as long as he yeah. wanted to be. It's like, it was three bands in Memphis playing down on Beale Street, and W.C. Handy just happened to have one of them. Okay. And it was three candidates, mm-hmm. and Handy was hired by Boss Crump. <laughs> and he wrote that campaign song that turned out to be the Memphis Blues. And the rest is history. The rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> now, so we, 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 we talk about blues. We know what blues is. As a top jazz jock for <laughs> a lot of years. I'm not going to put a number on it. I, I'll yeah. get it wrong, but a lot of years. Yeah. Been a while. So what's what's your definition of jazz? Now see, now that's a hard one too. Uh, because I look back on the history of it, the whole thing, all the way back from where it came from and when I first got into it. And you know, when we were Mr. Thomas, uh, he got us into Major jazz, right? You know, right. uh, uh, weather report. Right. That's the first time right. I heard that. Doc right. Severance and right. all these things, but 
my dad used to listen to Nat King Cole right. all the time. Right. And he also used to talk about how they would walk the tables at the Hotel Men's Improvement Club down there on Beale Street when the swing bands were going Jimmy Lunsford and those guys. Right. So uh, it's really hard to categorize jazz as anything but just great music, like Mr. Thomas said, sounds that are pleasing to the ear. Right, right. Well, you know what? That's a great point. I looked up a number of definitions of jazz, and they were different, but the thing that was the same, what was consistent about from definition to definition, is two main things. Number one is jazz is an African-American art form. It was created, created by black folk. Number two is quint- quintessentially American. Did not, yeah. did not happen, did not come up, occur anywhere else on the planet but the United States. So um, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like we can attribute other music forms to that as well. Spirituals, um, you know, the, blues, r and B. I I mean... The paper that I had to do back in undergrad, I don't know if I mentioned it before, okay. but, but then the paper that I had to do was a description of jazz or where I thought it came from in the history, and I did a lot of research on it. So, it, and But it, it started basically with the slave work songs, mm-hmm. which my mother taught us some, too, mm-hmm. because they know from... But the old slave work songs went to the... To the uh, Christian song, gospel mm-hmm, songs, mm-hmm. because the, they were learning Christianity. Mm-hmm. They mixed those gospel songs with those work songs. It was a mixture of Africa and America then. Right. Those Christian gospel songs turned into the blues. And the blues through Scott Joplin and those guys with their ragtime started Evolved refining into it jazz. into jazz. And every other music in America that has been popular culture music has come from there. Right, right. The symphony music is European, but the jazz... Is, is America, and you know there is something that is a um, something about jazz and its existence and its sound that is all about us. And let me tell you what that is: European music is written. Okay, it is written. It is on paper, and you play what you read. You don't typically add to it. You don't take anything away from it. But you absolutely don't improvise. But you know us. <laughs> <laughs> you know us. Well, it was a matter of we survival. We are going to improvise. Absolutely. It was a matter of survival. Absolutely. Basic survival. And, and all of us couldn't re- certainly couldn't read music. No. So, so we would take a basic rhythm and do our own thing with it. And so it's, it's freedom. I mean. But I'm going to tell you something, though. When you say that, though. Most of the early jazz musicians were trained musicians, right? Uh, because of coming from way back in the day, they had to be the entertainers. Right. They had to perform the music that Absolutely. people wanted to hear. So Absolutely. they were they, they had to know how to read, yeah. as this next group that we're going to hear coming up had to. This is the great. Duke Ellington and his oh, yeah. band. You think they weren't reading some things? Oh, they... So, uh, absolutely, totally accomplished musicians. And um, check them out. They could improvise a little bit too.
Edward Ellington, also known as the Duke. Yes. One of the greatest of all time. And his band. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing to me, man, that that um, cats like Duke and Count Basie could have such a big band with so many stellar artists involved. Brilliant musicians, yeah. You know, and that tune, A Train, with it, written by Strayhorn, who mm-hmm. was also right there with Absolutely. him all along. Absolutely. Uh, was turned out to be one of the seminal pieces of jazz, swing music, mm-hmm. starting off. But you know, we in the middle of mentioning Duke Ellington, you know, I wanted to talk about that too, That as we're talking about the definition of jazz. Mm-hmm. Duke, I did an interview with his, his granddaughter, Mercer's okay. daughter. Yeah. Uh, and and Duke said that he didn't want to categorize jazz. He said jazz was music. He said, I don't care if it's jazz, if it's what it is, gospel or or or, or uh, whatever it is, it's music, symphony music, it's music. He said that music is beyond category. Right. So you can't call jazz anything but music, right. you know? That's an interesting piece. That's an interesting piece because um, I agree with that. I agree with that. I don't think anything... Okay, so I think Jazz is jazz to me is gumbo and barbecue okay. and barbecue sauce. Okay, I say gumbo because we were talking about New Orleans and all of that. When you you make your gumbo your way, now certainly it's there are elements of it that have to be there to make it gumbo. But you know what? You can put some extra stuff in, and if you put some extra stuff in to make it yours, make it uniquely yours, ain't nobody mad at you. Yeah, yeah. In 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 our neck of the woods here in Memphis, it's about barbecue sauce. No two people make barbecue sauce <laughs> the same <laughs> way. No, 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 no. But I mean, there's some elements of it that must be there to make it authentic. And I and I think as it regards jazz. I mean, there's some things that make it authentic. I mean, rhythm, syncopation, improvisation, um, and all of that make it authentic. But everything else, you can't define. You can't categorize. You can't put it in a box, a really tiny box, because it's too big. Beyond category. It's beyond category. You can't define it, right? And, and, you know, and one thing about that, too, is the styles, what you you just mentioned, because we always think of Duke coming out of D.C., going to New York, Mm -hmm. and Duke Ellington in Harlem, you Mm -hmm. know, that was New York jazz. Count Basie was in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. St. Louis was a big deal Mm -hmm. going on at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then there was West Coast jazz. Jimmy Lunsford was here. Jimmy Lunsford was, yeah. Started here anyway, yeah. You know, it's so cool, too, that Jimmy Lunsford, we got to mention him, talking about swing bands and the skill of the musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, Jimmy Lunsford took his high school students from Manassas High School and made a swing band that set the standard for the swing bands. And could read music (laughs) like Banshees at a young age. You know, we always look at those movies back when when we were when we were young, right. and they had the TV, the movies on television, uh, the, the the musicals, right? The Glenn Miller story, right. Kay Kaiser, right. and all that Everybody stuff. Everybody's sharp as a tack, and you'd see those guys stand up by right. section right. to play horns. Right. Right. Jimmy Lunsford started that right. stuff, and Duke Ellington and those guys they started to 
dressing in tuxedos that's, and that's, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Class. I mean, and that's all that's part all part of it's an attitude too. That's yeah. all part of the style and the attitude and all of that. And that's why it can't be it can't be restricted. And that's why I get upset when 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 jazz purists, people that are purely into straight ahead, let's say, yeah. um start, you know, talk <clears throat> disparagingly about somebody, anybody that's not doing straight ahead stuff. Um, and w- that's been happening for a long time. I mean, um, yeah. as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, we got an interview with another master that talks about um, what some people said about him and described him. And uh, y'all listen to this. You don't define jazz. Jazz is just like a, an attitude. See, music is nothing but styles like I do. I play. I play a style. If it's a blues, I play the blues. If it's a ballad, I play the ballad. If it's funky, I play that. If it's fast, I play that. Not one style. You know, people say he's so loud and shit like that. I don't know what they're talking about, and I don't care to to to, to try to think like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Sold out. Oh, I, I missed that one. You know, that's some bullshit. They did, no, yeah. That's, that's, that's what musicians say when they're lazy and don't want to learn different things about music. You know, like the white man just says, you cool, and you just pick up an instrument, and you can play with a lot of feel. Stay there. Hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You don't study. You know, whatever they learn when they started out, that's what that, that's all they know. People like that say that. Chance is just like a, an attitude. It has a center to it, but it sounds, it cuts the sound so you can like shape the sound with your mouth. You know? And if you've been doing it as, as long as I've been doing it, it's, I mean, it's just automatic. It's just one. Okay. Ain't nothing but a move. Jazz. To Europeans, it has a meaning, says Miles. And to Americans, it has a meaning. When they say jazz, they mean a concept that a person has that's not straight as legit white composers, old composers, Russian or whatever, have. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Here, it means that you're a nigger and you play an instrument that you didn't study. That's what I get from it. So I, I, I ignore the critics. That was the master, Miles Davis. Yeah. Miles sounds like jazz, you know? Yeah, he's got that voice. He's got that <laughs> voice, like yours. <laughs> well, I like yours. There's that. a sound of, I mean, there's a real cool sound. And you can't sound like mine. You have to sound like you're almost whispering. He was. He, it, Miles, I, I love it in the in his book, uh, autobiography of Miles Davis. Mm-hmm. You know, anyway, mm-hmm. he's got a, a part in there where he was so frustrated about his situation mm-hmm. because you know he said everybody comes up to him and asked and, and talked to him now about uh, coming up from the bottom and, and you know being success. He mm-hmm. said my daddy was a dentist. dentist. <laughs> That's <laughs> he, right. I don't know nothing about no bottom. Yeah, I, I wasn't poor. What are you talking about? <laughs> He was his own he man. Took lessons. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um now, can you imagine? Can you imagine somebody forming and shaping their lips to say that Miles Davis was a sellout? Yeah. Well, because he, he was doing something different. But I mean, you know, the conversation Miles was such so much jazz that the conversation can go around him in controversy all the time. Mm-hmm. Cuz when he and Train went into the air avant-garde phase mm-hmm. back in mm-hmm. the late 50s mm-hmm. and early 60s. Mm-hmm. I, to me, they ruined things yeah. uh, between the two of them. <laughs> well, suffice it to say, you needed to be in a certain state uh, and frame of mind, uh, drug or alcohol. <laughs> <'Cause the> Colum- <laughs> to really be into that. When those cats were recording with Columbia, Someday My Prince Will Come, yeah. and all the yeah. Muted Miles yeah. thing, yeah. Yes. that last CD they did, yes. Muted Miles, yes. they, it was, I mean, he couldn't be touched. Right. He couldn't be touched. Right. Then he and Train went off into that thing. Yeah. His first phase was swing. You know, he was with Dizzy now. Yeah. Dizzy and Charlie Parker, those guys. 
Um, absolutely, and they were playing so fast, yeah. and so he, fast. And then he went into the funk mode, though. That's why they said he totally. And and I think when he um, and for those of you who don't know, he um, put a pickup on his trumpet and started literally playing his trumpet, uh, even music Electronic. through a, through an amp. Through an amp, and you know, so many people just lost it. So, oh my God, yeah. what has he? What is he doing? What has he done? But as he described, anybody that's not grown, it's lazy. I mean, they they, they got you, you. You do the same thing the same way all the time. He uh, terms musicians like that as as lazy. Yeah, um, yeah. That's why he said when they asked him, "What did you, what do you do?" He said, "I I invented jazz four absolutely, times." Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. The last one being, you know, uh, the, the, funk, the whole man. electronic funk uh, with bitches brew and 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 all oh, and that. This last, oh, I can't think of the name of that last CD. That was killer. It's the one, you know, it's one little fact I wanted to pop in there about Miles. He had a kid that was playing piano going to Europe with him, and he asked him, do you play funk? Uh-huh. And he said, no, I don't play no funk. So Miles left him at home and took <laughs> Joey D. Francesco with him. <laughs> I, heard, I can't even remember this other cat's name. That's Joey funny. D. is a big deal. You now. know Joey D., yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And speaking of Miles, a uh, bit of trivia, the uh, what is deemed to be the greatest jazz album of all time and the biggest selling album jazz album of all time just happens to be a Miles Davis album called Kind of Blue. Oh, man. And here's a cut from that.
We are riffing on jazz on the Kazookian Network. Shop the bitty no one little baby no We are riffing on jazz, definitely and definitively. We're letting the masters, Malvin, letting the masters describe what jazz is. Yeah, that was great. That, that was, was great. Piece starting, right out with, um, starting out with uh, Miles Davis uh, with So What? And then uh, segueing into uh, Mel Torme and Ella Fitzgerald, yeah. defining all the different kinds of jazz. And they they mentioned every, they mentioned quite a few of them. Absolutely, too. They, they absolutely. The it, that's something about jazz too. We talk about it as a, as an entity of its own totally. in itself, but. There are so many different segments of it, like they said, swing and, and the pop and the bebop. And it's the gumbo, thing. man. It's gumbo. Yeah, we talked about it last show that uh, CB said that Charlie Parker then started playing fast because Glenn Miller then started taking the gigs <laughs> and playing the way they used to play. So they had to come up with some kind of Something way. different. Yeah. <laughs> Something different. But um, that's... You know, that's the beauty to me of uh, of jazz and so many things. And, and these guys and ladies could do so anything they wanted to do. I, we were pointing out to our producer, young fella, uh, <laughs> bless his heart, Larry Robinson, um, but we were introducing him to the idea that Mel Torme, who he just heard doing that scat uh, with Ella Fitzgerald, wrote the Christmas song. Sure Chestnuts did. roasting on an open fire. Now, if he didn't write anything else in life, the royalties <laughs> of that would pay for a lot of stuff. But the, and the side story on that is he wrote that song, and I think it was with Al Khan, but I'm not sure. But okay. he wrote the song for himself, and when they got through writing it. They had to have somebody to sing it. He said, Nat's got to sing that this. That King Cole, baby. <laughs> the song of Nat King Cole. Call Nat. Now, that's jazz, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's the idea of jazz. But so many people miss it. So many people miss it. They miss. You take somebody like Ray Charles. Let's uh, talk about Ray Charles. Is there any genre of music that Ray Charles couldn't do? He did no. them all. No. He did them all. He started, he probably started playing in the, the church. church. Yeah, yeah, probably started playing gospel there. or whatever. But he went, he evolved into jazz 
He played blues. He could play. Well, actually, he played stride. He learned how to play. And don't they call it stride, stride piano? Yeah. Piano, yeah. And not only that, he played country music. Country, uh, pop, R and B. Hit the road, Jack. Sold nine zillion <laughs> records. And you know what? I love the idea too. During his heyday, you know, his music director was. Hank Crawford. Hank Crawford from yeah. Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. But, I mean, so many of these guys t- showing you um, their versatility. You know, uh, um, a lot of people thought or maybe still think that um, so many people played smooth jazz. You know, people that had a problem with smooth jazz. Um, straight ahead, people that, that, that couldn't stand uh, smooth jazz, and if you say Kenny, mention Kenny G's name, they throw up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of them, I think, really dissed the professionalism that these musicians that played smooth jazz and made a living, uh, a lot of them made a living in that genre. Um, they they thought they did it because they couldn't play anything else. Because they be, couldn't play. Couldn't play any better than that. Are yeah. they crazy? And, you know, there's a lot of covers going on in there. Stevie Wonder probably is the most covered musician ever, uh, uh, songwriter ever in the world. Absolutely. Because of smooth jazz artists, a lot of them. But but those guys, I mean, they just did. I, I told you once before, Grove Washington made a smooth jazz CD, and he made a straight ahead CD. Mm-hmm. And I asked him about it, and he said, you got to eat. Brother got to eat. Brother got to eat. The straight ahead CDs didn't, didn't sell, sell as sell fast right. as right. the smooth jazz CDs. I'm going gonna, gonna to call some names. And they got one thing in common. You know what it is, and you tell the people what they all have in common. Here are the names. It's a who's who. Herbie Hancock, Freddie Hubbard, Chick Corea, Quincy Jones, George Duke, uh, Chuck Mangione, Donald Byrd, Lonnie Liston-Smith, Stanley Clark, Russell Ferrante. Uh, did, am I through? From the Yellow Jackets, of course. From the Yellow Jackets. Uh, what do they all have in common, Melvin Massey? Every one of them is an alumni of the Art Blakey Jazz Messengers. Art Blakey, Art Blakey. Jazz Messengers. We looked at a list. Yeah. There were 217, <laughs> 217 notable, tremendous musicians that came through Art Blakey, that played with Art Blakey. Roy Hargrove said that Art Blakey did more for jazz and and building jazz artists than anybody else in the history of the music. Absolutely, absolutely. And so they weren't playing uh, smooth jazz, or they don't play smooth jazz because they can't play anything else. They play smooth jazz because it is an extension of their jazz chops and a way to express themselves. And it just happens to be widely, it just happens to have wide appeal. It's very popular it's because very popular. it's music you can dance to. It's music that pleases your ear. Absolutely. I ain't yeah. mad at him. I ain't no, mad at him. No, no, no. I ain't I, mad I, at him. You still have improvisation. I mean, you still have rhythm. You still have the uh, syncopation. You still have all of the elements of jazz, That the elements of that gumbo of that barbecue, that good barbecue <laughs> sauce. <laughs> you know, you talk about how long I've been doing this with that, so on my show. I got a chance to interview, I've had a chance to interview a lot of guys. Mm-hmm. And one that I'm really proud of, I got a chance to interview Dave Brubeck. Oh, yeah. And I got a chance to ask him that question. What do you think about Smooth Jazz? He said, let me tell you something. Anything that brings more people into jazz is good music. Absolutely. It's good jazz. Absolutely. If it's Smooth Jazz that brings them into jazz, Smooth jazz is the right thing to do. Totally. And introduces them to it where 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 straight ahead couldn't. A lot of people are intimidated by straight ahead. They don't understand it. They mm. they, they 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 you know, they think my wife is one of these that she lo- she Uh-oh. loves music, she loves jazz, but she thinks and in some straight ahead there's a certain amount of self-indulgence that, you know, just like somebody that talks too long because they love to hear themselves talk. But now we did talk about that. I mentioned about Miles and and and, and that avant-garde thing that right. Miles and Train Right, guys right, did. right. They, yeah. they were playing to themselves and to, you know, now trying they to lost impress you on, other they musicians. They lost you on that one, didn't they? Oh, they lost a lot of folks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, said, it, it is said that uh, Stan Getz and Jean Gilberto and the girl from Ipanema, right. uh, Cannonball Adderley, who we talked about last time, right. Mercy, Mercy Me, right. and uh, Dave Brubeck, Take Five, Rescue Jazz. Jazz. 
Yeah, for miles. <laughs> that's fabulous. That's, <laughs> fly, that's fabulous. These guys coming up uh, did their part too. They were originally known as the Jazz Crusaders. Dropped the jazz part to just Crusaders. Oh yeah. I still hang around. Neither lost nor found. Hear the lonely sound of music in the night. Nights are always bright. That's all that's left for me. The Crusaders, um, great group, great yeah. group. Sticks, uh, we're, Sticks Hooper, Hooper on drums, yeah. Wilton Feld on saxophone, yes. Joe Sample on the keys. Joe Sample. Uh, uh, who else was in there? There was several groups, guys in there. Wayne Henderson was in well, there yeah. for a yeah. while too. Yeah, yeah, fantastic group, fantastic group. So, 
Jazz, definitely and definitively, what have we learned, boys and girls? Uh, <laughs> I think we have learned that uh, it's exactly what you said. It defies category. I think yeah. the, the synonymous things about the origins of jazz uh, are that they are quintessentially, it is quintessentially African American and quintessentially American. American. Um, and that without those two elements, without Africans in America, there would be no jazz. Exactly. Um, exactly. And um, and so you, you don't define it. I mean, something that broad, you can't have a, a tight definition for it. It's uh, impossible. I mean, and, and it's it's it has expanded. It expanded the whole time. Even Dizzy Gillespie started expanding into the Latin side. Mm-hmm. He went down there to Cuba. He recruited the guys like Arturo Sandoval and, uh, and Paquito de Rivera and these yes, guys. Yes. Uh, Eddie Gomez went to Paris and heard Ileani Elias playing in Paris and brought her to New York to play with Randy Brecker right. and uh, Michael Brecker at their club. Uh, Slug, not Slugs. But anyway, that was when Iliani came first came to America. Right. Uh, the Afro Latin sound created into jazz mm-hmm. from Brazil, from Cuba, from all, all these places. Beautiful. That's a whole nother thing. Beautiful. A whole nother this even topic of conversation. With Sergio Mendez playing jazz. Ah, Sergio Mendez <laughs> with Oscar Castro Neves. <laughs> 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 who was his music, Sergio Mendez music director, yes, by the yes, way. Yes, yes. Uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim yes, was yes. the reason that Stan gets Flora Pur- Purim. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. Erto Moriera. Yes, her yes. I mean, all of those sounds mix in there. And it was Diz that got it going. Diz got part that going. A good part of wow, it. Uh, wow. There's some other cats involved, wow. too, but Diz was, was the main one. That, and that's the beauty. Of, the beauty of it is the diversity of it. That, um, you know, you have... You have Latin jazz. You know, you have you have cats like we we were talking about Russell Ferrante. Um, yeah, from you the have Yellow Jackets. from yeah. the Yellow Jackets of the Yellow Jackets. Now, how and where did Russell learn how to play gospel? Like he was raised in the Greater Triple Rock Missionary <laughs> Baptist Church. How how did that happen? The, the the time that I asked him about that down at the New Daisy Theater, he said that because he went to a church, he played he piano, played piano in, in a church in a black learned, church. I don't know if he you know it was a black a church. church. <laughs> but Russell said he played in the church. That's why he sounds like he's playing at church. <laughs> That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful yeah. thing. That is a beautiful thing. So yeah, I mean, there there are so many faces and facets of of jazz, and 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 that's the beauty of it all. So yeah. uh, listen, you know, word to the wise: don't try to define it. Don't try to down anybody because they don't happen to be playing the style of jazz that you happen to prefer. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, don't hate, appreciate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> We're coming up on a cat uh, who just left us. I mean, we had him booked at the GPAC. You know, he was going to be here coming to town. He passed away. Al Jarreau, he sort of redefined. So I had Marvell Thomas told me one time, he said, man, y'all play too many uh, vocals. You know, jazz mm-hmm. is supposed to be instrumental. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and I, I brought that up to him. I said, what are you going to say about Al Jarreau, Sarah Vaughn, all his, the right. great vocalists? Right. Billy Eckstein, who, the, Billy Eckstein's band was like Art Blakey's Jazz Messengers right. as far back in the day. Quincy Jones played little, with them. Little, little tip. When I was with Stax, when I was with Stax, I got to be on the road with Billy Eckstein and Chico Hamilton. Are you kidding? They were signed, they were signed to a, a Stax label. A jazz, Stax had a jazz <laughs> subsidiary. And uh, so I was in St. Louis with Billy Eckstein, and I was in all over the place with Chico. Oh, man. So, right, but, uh, you know, the thing about it is that vocals are part of jazz, too. And especially guys like you mentioned, Bobby McFerrin, who had that Don't a Worry, Be Happy like that everybody went totally. crazy about. But Al Jarreau redefined jazz vocals. Smooth, Latin, straight ahead. He he did it. Scatting. A, yeah, he did everything with his voice. His Absolutely. voice was his instrument. It's an instrument. It's an instrument yeah. like Bobby McFerrin and uh, like so many. You you know you've got a lot of uh, you've got a lot of a cappella groups now. I think that oh, oh a lot. Take to six guys, is the oh, best oh, one. Oh, oh. Naturally, seven comes in pretty good. With right, them. but um, New York voices that oh that oh a lot to uh, uh, Al Jarreau, Al Jarreau yeah. pioneer, pioneer. We're gonna go out with that. You guys uh, be good. Take care of yourselves. And uh, we'll be back 
get back with us, be with us next week, same time, same place, riffing on jazz. We had a good time. Again. <laughs> Conversation now is all right when you take it back. So polite, for you to put off for a light. You start a little conversation now, it's all right when you're taking fire.
my music should matter personally because I feel like I'm saying what Robert Glasper has to say. I'm not saying what somebody else said and just repeating it. You know, I have a story to tell and that's what I'm doing through my music. You know, you hear my music, you're hearing my personal story. A lot of people are telling someone else's story and they make their, their, their whole life about telling somebody else's story. You know what I mean? Uh, but when you hear my music, I think I'm just being honest about all of my influences and what I like and what I don't like. You know, what you don't like makes you who you are just as much as what you do like, you know, and it's okay. So, uh, you know, I think my music is just an honest reflection of me. Riffin' on Jazz is recorded at Kazookian Studios, hosted by Malvin Massey Jr. and Howard Robertson. Music curation, Howard and Malvin. Recorded, produced, and distributed by Kazookian. Yeah.